So good afternoon, everybody. Why don't we get started if we could? And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome um, Julie Brill. Julie is currently a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission of the United States government. Um, I'll say a little bit about her background, but the talk that she's giving here today is entitled Global Regulation of Data in a Post-Snowden World. Uh, reference to Edward Snowden and the reality that suddenly national security is now colliding with a lot of data privacy issues for individuals, for businesses um, around the world, uh, given the revelations of Edward Snowden. So um, uh, I will say this uh, talk uh, is uh, co-sponsored here at Tuck by our Center for Global Business and Government, thanks to the generosity of Burt Killingstead and the Killingstead Distinguished Speaker Series, and also joint with our Center for Digital Strategies as well, the Glassmeyer Center for Digital Strategies. Um, Julie, I had the distinct pleasure to meet this past summer. We were on a panel together speaking at the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, Colorado, about kind of the future of the U.S. economy and where jobs are going to come from and an increasing global economy and that sort of thing. Um, and we chatted a little bit before, and I got to learn a little bit that Julie, in addition to her distinguished public service, I'll say a bit more about it in a minute, um, is also relatively local. She knows this area, living in Randolph, Vermont, and I thought to myself at the time, ah, serendipity and perhaps uh, despite her busy public service schedule, she might be able to come uh, to the Tuck School at some point. So given the business of her life and, and her generosity, we did manage to eventually get her here. And we're just so honored to have her here, given um, the service she provides to the country um, and the insights that she's going to share with us. So I'll say a little bit about Julie's background and turn it over to her. She's got some prepared remarks, and then she's going to open up to a general conversation here. Um, so Julie was sworn in as a, an FTC commissioner uh, in April of 2010, so has been serving the United States very uh, uh, admirably for almost five years at this point. Um, she has been widely cited as one of the most impactful and successful commissioners in recent history, if not longer. I'll give a few quotes on that. Uh, she's been named, quote, the commission's most important voice on internet privacy and data security issues. A, quote, key regulator on not just a national, but also on an international stage. And I can attest to that as we've tried to track her down in the world to figure out when she might be able to join us. Um, one of, quote, the top four U.S. government players leading the data privacy debate. And so, again, this issue of data and in, in the ongoing innovations in the IT world is such a salient issue for us as individuals, us in the United States. If we think of the recent data breaches with uh, Target, with, um, with Anthem, uh, with Home Depot, uh, businesses are being affected by these data breaches, so the Sony Pictures um, uh, debacle in recent times. And where this intersects with individuals and with business is evolving literally by kind of the day, it seems like. President Obama spoke on some of these issues a few days ago in California. And regulators around the world are grappling with national security concerns, with consumer protection and privacy concerns, and the international trade and investment community as well. And Julie has been a leading voice on this and has been thinking about this for many years, even in her time before public service. She has a very distinguished career before her time in the U.S. government. Um, and her background originally, she graduated from Princeton University and from New York University School of Law. And her accolades pre-public service are many. We're very fortunate to have her here at Tuck today. And I just want to invite everybody to join me in welcoming her to Tuck today. So Thanks. Julie Grill. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. So thanks so much. It's great to be here, and thanks, Matt, for that um, very nice introduction. And also, congratulations on being named Dean. I think Thank that's, you. that's really great. Thank you. Um, so can you all hear me OK? I, OK, great. Um, so as uh, Matt said, I do have some prepared remarks. And the reason they're prepared is because there's a lot of material that I thought I would go through for you to just kind of level set where we are on some of these issues. But then the part that I'm really looking forward to is the conversation. Um, so, uh, and, and being here, the reason why the conversation is so important for me is, you know, I feel like I'm really touching the next generation of business leaders. I mean, not only through those of you who are students, but also those of you who are professors here who get to teach folks year in and year out about a lot of these issues, which are, to me, incredibly important. Um, the internet has become today's global trade route. It has made not only possible, but easy for companies to deliver products and services to consumers all over the world. One study found that economic activity taking place over the internet is growing at 10% per year within the G20 group of nations. The Department of Commerce reported last year that the U.S. exported nearly $360 billion in digitally deliverable services 
and that the national surplus in such services is about $130 billion. One of the key drivers in the internet economy is the flow of personal data. In the context of online services, the collection and analysis of data about individual consumers is integral to how some of the largest companies in the world do business. For example, Facebook has become a company with a $200 billion capitalization, largely through its sale of ads that reach Facebook users. But data also allows small and medium companies to monetize their services, as Matt and I talked about in Aspen this past summer. The World Economic Forum believes that data-driven enterprise could be part of a strategy for economic development in vulnerable regions of the world. Now, at the same time, we're seeing the development of a wave of innovations based on connecting everyday objects, from light bulbs to appliances to cars to the internet. This phenomenon, which is known as the Internet of Things, and as Patrick mentioned, I guess the Digital Strategies, the Center for Digital Strategies had the Internet of Things as one of its themes very recently, an incredibly important issue. Um, but so the Internet of Things promises not only to make our lives more convenient and efficient, but also to offer insights that could help us solve some of society's most pressing problems. This is due not only to connected devices themselves, but also to the data that they generate. Data from wearable fitness devices could help each of us get motivated to eat better or exercise more, while at the, at the same time also providing important information to health researchers. Data from connected cars might help us find a quicker route to our destination and also shed light on how traffic engineers should design highways to minimize traffic delays. And when teachers use tablets and apps in their classrooms, they can expose their students to challenges and experiences that are individually tailored, while at the same time giving educators and researchers greater insight into what works and what doesn't work in education. So a great deal rides on data, and not just any kind of data, but personal data. That means that a great deal also rides on how we protect this personal data. Protecting individual privacy and keeping data secure are integral to the success of the data-driven economy because they're essential to earning and keeping consumers' trust. I spend a lot of time talking with industry leaders from many sectors of the economy, and I believe that many of them understand this. Put simply, none of them wants their company to be in the headlines for failing to implement reasonable data security, deceiving consumers about the company's data practices, or collecting or using consumers' data unfairly. But engendering consumer trust in the data-driven economy isn't as simple as companies' compliance with federal and state laws. Because data flows are now global, so are data privacy and security issues. Here in the US, protecting consumer privacy and data security are top priorities of the Federal Trade Commission, as well as other state and federal agencies. And I'm proud of the work that we do along these lines. But I'll be honest with you, the US privacy framework is different from those in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. While the United States embraces many of the same privacy principles as other countries, excuse me, just pick that up. We've embraced many of the same principles as these other areas, and we've developed ways to make our systems interoperable. The differences between these frameworks create real challenges. The first challenge is that some international thought leaders within government, business community, and the civil society of our trading partners do not fully understand U.S. privacy law. Some of them believe that our system offers little or no privacy or security protections for data about individuals. Some think that the US is the Wild West, where data practices are concerned. Others think that privacy protections in the US are voluntary, and the only way that a company can get into trouble with people like me or state attorneys general or other uh, law enforcement uh, entities is by making a promise about a product or service that it offers and then failing to live up to that promise. I would like to explain why these notions are misunderstandings. In the process, I hope to give you a better sense of what US law requires 
and what the Federal Trade Commission expects of companies under its jurisdiction. Now, the second challenge is that for those of you who end up working in a data-driven firm uh, with global reach, and this describes now not just the typical technology firms that we all know about, but also car companies, appliance manufacturers, and many other firms, you all are going to be facing another challenge. You're going to need to navigate different national privacy laws and the cultural and political systems in which they're embedded. How the privacy laws in other countries relate to our own is the subject of intense debate, particularly in Europe, in the wake of revelations about the U.S. intelligence community's data collection activities. Now, while I can't offer tidy predictions about how these debates are going to be resolved or when, I can give you reasons to be optimistic that things are going to work out. So first, let me dive into the U.S. privacy framework to help set the conversation. The notion that the United States doesn't have a privacy law stems primarily from the fact that we do not have a single comprehensive law that governs the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information in the commercial sphere. Instead, here in the United States, there are a variety of federal and state laws that play an important role in protecting the privacy and security of individuals' information. Some federal privacy laws apply to specific sectors, like healthcare, banking, credit reporting, and communications. Other federal laws protect children's and students' privacy. The states have many additional privacy laws that range from limiting employers' ability to view, their to view their employees' social network accounts, prohibiting employers and insurers from using information about certain medical conditions, and requiring online services to allow minors to delete information that they have posted, to requiring companies to notify consumers when they suffer a security breach involving personal information. In addition to these specific laws, both at the federal and the state level, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act prohibits unfair and deceptive acts and practices. And the FTC has used this authority to address a number of data security and privacy practices that fall through some of the gaps in the more specific U.S. laws. So the FTC has been the cop on the privacy and data security beat since the rise of the commercial internet. The FTC has entered into this arena because the potential for consumers to be harmed by losing control of personal information <coughs> was clear. Over the past 15 years or so, we have brought nearly 100 law enforcement actions protecting millions of consumers in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere from deceptive and unfair um, trade practices. We have used this authority to bring enforcement actions against well-known companies like Google, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, and even Snapchat. We've also brought cases against companies that are not household names, but violated the law by spamming consumers, installing spyware on their computers, failing to secure consumers' personal information, deceptively tracking consumers online, violating children's privacy, and inappropriately collecting information on consumers' mobile devices. Most importantly, the broad reach and remedial focus of Section 5 allows the FTC to protect consumers from harm as new technologies and business practices emerge. Now, I'd like to spend just a moment or two explaining how we've been able to do that. So first, let's consider some of the Commission's actions against companies for failing to provide appropriate transparency and choice about their personal data practices to consumers. Many of the cases in this area have been pretty straightforward. A company makes a promise that it's going to do something with consumers' data, and then it actually does something else, fails to live up to its promise. But things get a bit more interesting when a company provides some information about their data collection and use practices to consumers, but leaves out material information about other practices. So just to take one example, in March of 2014, the FTC brought an action against the vendor of an app 
that turned the LED, the, the light emitting diode, on a mobile phone, which is most widely known for uh, being the flash bulb that people use when they're using their phone's camera. This app used the LED to turn the phone into the functional equivalent of a flashlight. But we believe the flashlight app was collecting precise geolocation information, along with a number that uniquely identified consumers' phones. The company's privacy policy disclosed that the app was collecting some, inf some data for product support and for similar purposes, but inappropriately, in our view, failed to mention the collection of this more sensitive geolocation and UDID information. The FTC has also used Section 5 to address data collection irrespective of specific representations to consumers. In 2013, for example, the FTC brought an action against a firm that developed software for rent-to-own companies to install on computers that they offered to consumers. And the purpose of the software was to disable the uh, computer if the consumer failed to make timely payments totally different consumer protection issue that we could talk about at a different talk, or if the computer was stolen. Now an add-on feature to the software was called detective mode. And this feature, add-on feature of the software, allowed rent-to-own companies to log keystrokes and capture screenshots of confidential and personal information, such as username and passwords, social media interactions, and transactions with financial institutions. It also allowed the rent-to-own companies to take pictures of anyone that came within view of the computer's web, web camera, all without alerting consumers of the existence of this software. We believed that collecting this deeply personal information, including pictures of consumers in their homes, in their bedrooms, and pictures of their kids, um, we believed that collecting this deeply personal information was harmful to consumers and therefore was unfair. To protect privacy comprehensively, we need to address more than just how companies collect and use personal information. Companies also need to ensure that they don't engage in practices that enable others to inappropriately obtain personal data through security breaches and hacks. You heard um, Dean Slaughter talk about that a moment ago, some of the very well-known uh, security breaches that have clearly gotten the attention of uh, companies, I, I believe now, having just attended the President's um, Cyber uh, Summit out in Stanford that many of you probably heard about, it is quite clear that data security issues are being discussed in the C-suites of companies. Now, the FTC plays an important role in that process and in ensuring companies are employing reasonable data security practices to prevent harm to consumers from data breaches. Data security is, a, is truthfully a very large part of our enforcement program. Over the past 13 years, we have brought 55 enforcement actions involving companies that we believed failed to engage in reasonable data security practices. Now, our initial data security enforcement efforts were focused on financial harms that consumers could suffer when their social security numbers or other information about their credit cards or bank accounts fell into the wrong hands. But we also focus on security lapses that expose other types of sensitive personal information, including medical information, pharmaceutical records, and social contacts. We also examine data security practices even where companies have not suffered from a data breach. Last year, for example, we settled actions in against or involving Credit Karma and Fandango, two popular uh, apps, because they were releasing mobile apps that were allegedly vulnerable to well-known attacks that could have led to the interception of credit card numbers, social security numbers, and other sensitive personal information that the apps were transmitting. I believe, as someone who's been a long time uh, a person involved in privacy and data security issues, I believe that privacy and security are two sides of the same coin. Because you can't have privacy without data security. Some of our recent cases demonstrate this fact, showing that data security is an integral part of privacy. So in our first enforcement action involving the Internet of Things, 
It was a case uh, involving a company known as TrendNet. We allege that TrendNet had provided internet-connected cameras, and we allege that they were vulnerable to having their feeds hijacked. And indeed, around 700 private video feeds, some of which, again, included images of people in their bedrooms and, and kids in the home um, going about their daily activities. These feeds were hacked and publicly posted as a result of TrendNet's allegedly lax security practices. And in our enforcement action involving Snapchat, a service that I think many of you probably use, we allege that the company deceived consumers in a number of ways about privacy and security. The part of the FTC's complaint that seemed to draw the most attention, and maybe some of you heard about, was the allegation that recipients of video or photo snaps could save them indefinitely using a few simple techniques, despite the company's representation that the snaps would disappear forever after a short period of time. But we also allege that the app exposed consumers' mobile phone numbers and left consumers vulnerable to being impersonated by other Snapchat users. So you can see how, with those two cases, issues around privacy and data security are really integrally related. Now, from time to time, I discuss these issues, all of these issues, about the US privacy regime and how, how things really work in the United States with my data protection colleagues in other countries, trying to describe the scope and the nuances of the US privacy framework. And also, frankly, the breadth of the FTC's enforcement efforts in this area. These conversations, and others like them that other people have, have helped increase the understanding abroad that far from being the Wild West of data collection and use, the United States, and particularly the FTC, engage in robust and carefully tailored privacy enforcement, including against companies whose data practices cause substantial harm, even if the companies make no promises about how they collect, use, or share data. Now, while Section 5 and sector-specific data privacy laws create good protections for consumers and their data, I believe our consumer privacy and data security framework can and should be improved. As more and more sensitive information flows throughout the commercial marketplace, I believe it's important to ensure that the data are appropriately protected. For example, health and personal financial information are at the center of many new apps, some of which I've described, and services and other, and frankly, uh, wearables and other devices. And many of them are operated by companies that are not covered by our sector-specific laws governing health and financial information. Yet the information that's being transmitted through these apps, through wearables and other connected devices, are just as sensitive and deserving of protection. And the growth of the Internet of Things, while frankly very exciting, will increase the need to adapt our data security laws. Experts estimate that as of this year, there will be 25 billion connected devices. And by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices. Now, a recent study by Hewlett Packard found that 90% of connected devices are collecting personal information and 70% of them are transmitting this data without encryption. I don't know about you, but I find those numbers to be really astounding. And the data security concerns raised by connected devices involve not only the unauthorized access of personal information that gets transmitted with you know, from the connected device, but also involves security threats to device functionality itself. If a device like a pacemaker or a car is hacked, very sensitive information could be compromised and the person using the device could be seriously harmed. And those are examples, the pacemaker and the car examples, those are examples where researchers have shown through proof of concept research that they can be easily hacked. Finally, consumers need to know more about and have better protections from inappropriate uses of data behind the scenes. 
data brokers are companies that assemb assemble individual profiles on consumers by collecting information from far-flung sources, but typically they do not interact with consumers themselves. Through these profiles, these data broker profiles, consumers can end up in marketing segments drawn along lines of race, ethnicity, financial status, health conditions, and other sensitive characteristics. Consumers deserve much more transparency and control concerning these profiles and, and the use of these profiles. And then as all companies begin to mine their own data for insights, who are their best customers, who is a high or low priority in terms of customer service and the like, companies also need to avoid treating their own customers in a manner that is unfair or discriminatory. Now, common sense steps have been, pro been proposed to deal with many of these concerns. President Obama visited the FTC just last month, and while there, he called on Congress to enact strong, flexible, and technology-neutral federal legislation to strengthen the FTC's existing data security enforcement tools and to provide notification to consumers when there is a security breach. The President also announced that he would seek to introduce baseline privacy legislation <coughs> that would create clearer rules of the road and give the FTC stronger enforcement tools, like the authority to obtain civil penalties from companies that break the law. The FTC has supported legislation on both of these fronts. In addition, both the White House and the FTC have called for data broker legislation that would bring more transparency and give consumers more choices about their data that is collected and used by data brokers. Uh, this is a pretty ambitious agenda. While we work with Congress to develop these legislative solutions, the FTC will continue to encourage companies to implement some of these reforms through best practices. There are many, many steps that companies can take on their own to do a lot to improve some of these, the, the, the concerns in some of these areas. And the FTC will continue to use its authority under Section 5 and under the sector-specific laws, some of them that I mentioned, to protect privacy and data security in the United States. Although it's not perfect, Section 5 allows us to proceed against a wide range of harmful data practices and provides for strong remedies that protect consumers and improve how companies handle data. This is a framework that I believe is effective, although it can be approved, improved, it is effective, and probably most importantly from your perspective, it is uniquely American. So how do other countries handle privacy? Let's just say right up front, they handle it differently. Most countries with industrialized economies have a baseline law that governs data practices in the commercial sphere. This is certainly the case in Europe, as well as Canada, Mexico, Israel, and Japan, just to name a few. Some privacy re regimes present unique challenges, including the emergence of data localization laws. Yet for the FTC and other parts of the US government, as well as companies that do business globally, Europe presents some of the most urgent questions about privacy frameworks and global data flows. So that's where I'm gonna focus my attention uh, for the rest of this talk. One of the major differences between the US and EU privacy frameworks is that in Europe, privacy is a fundamental right. The Charter of Fundamental Rights establishes rights to the protection of private life and of personal data. The EU's 1995 directive adopts a comprehensive set of privacy rights that determines how companies may legally process data about EU citizens. The directive requires each of the member states of the EU, of the, Euro the European Union, and that's 28 member states, to adopt a national law that implements the principles of the privacy directive, the 1995 directive. In the US, we have enshrined some privacy principles within the Constitution's 4th and 14th Amendments, but the privacy and security of consumer information generally has not yet been recognized as a constitutional right. 
Yet I find that the U.S. and EU have a great deal in common when we move beyond this question of rights and examine the individual liberties and other values that we want to protect, including protecting consumer privacy in a data-driven economy. Issues of trust, including privacy and data security, are a pillar of the ambitious digital agenda put forth by the European Commission, which is the administrative arm of the European Union's government. The European Commission stated in a July 2014 communication that we are witnessing a new industrial revolution driven by digi digital data, computation, and automation. And the European Commission concluded in this communication that fully developing this potential requires ensuring that users have sufficient trust in the technology, the behaviors of providers, and the rules governing them, and that appropriate data protection laws are ways to build this trust. Similarly, the Article 29 Working Party, which is a group that consists of the data protection um, authorities in uh, the member states um, of the EU, the Article 29 Working Party also noted last September that the Internet of Things holds, and I quote, significant prospects of growth for a great number of innovating and creative EU companies. But it also stated, the Working Party also stated, these expected benefits must also respect the many privacy and security challenges. Now these efforts in Europe to tie together the promise of the data-driven economy with the need to appropriately address privacy and security are similar in many ways to, to the discussions underway here in the United States, driven by policy recommendations from the White House and from the Federal Trade Commission, as I've just discussed. Moreover, just as we have done in the United States, European policymakers have identified gaps and other problems in their own privacy framework and are seeking to address them. The EU is in the midst of a years-long process to address these challenges through a new privacy law. This new law will be known as a regulation rather than a directive, meaning that there will be a single law for the entire EU that will be put into place. The proposed regulation borrows from the United States law in its effort to add some protections that were first developed here and do, that do not yet appear in European law, including heightened protections for children's information and notification to consumers after a data security breach. The proposed regulation also could include enhanced enforcement tools by increasing fines and creating a more streamlined process for the various data protection authorities to engage in investigations and enforcement. Again, a concept that I believe in part was borrowed from how we do enforcement in, the, in this area in the United States. The regulation could also bring clarity to issues that are at the center of fervent debate among companies, advocates, and privacy officials, such as the role of consent in data protection, and including with respect to the Internet of Things, and the contours of a right to be forgotten. Now, the proposed regulation is working its way through a complicated legislative process that involves the European Commission, Parliament, and the European Council. Many observers are predicting that the proposed regulation will be adopted probably in 2016, with implementation potentially years later. For now, the directive governs. That is, until the proposed regulation is adopted and implemented, the directive will be uh, the, the, the law that people have to follow, or the, the, the guidance that countries will have to follow with respect to their privacy laws in Europe. And the directive includes another important aspect of European privacy law. It prohibits companies from sending EU citizens' data outside the EU unless the destination is to a country that provides an adequate level of protection for the data. The European Commission has the authority to determine whether non-EU countries meet this adequacy requirement. Several countries have applied for and obtained an adequacy determination. The United States has not applied for it, 
and therefore has not received an adequacy determination. There are, however, mechanisms that allow personal data to legally flow from the EU to the United States. From the time the directive went into force, the EU and the United States both recognized that prohibiting such data flows would be harmful to the economies on both sides of the Atlantic. As the initial safe harbor negotiations approached their conclusion in, in the year 2000, the White House noted that the arrangement, that is a safe harbor arrangement allowing for these data flows, would protect privacy in accordance with the EU law while preventing the potential disruption of approximately $120 billion in US-EU trade. So that was in the year 2000. The amount at stake has only increased since then. This mutual interest in transatlantic data flows led to the US-EU safe harbor framework, which allows specific companies to certify that they provide adequate protections for personal data. So there are two main pieces to, uh, to the safe harbor. First, the framework spells out seven privacy principles that companies must follow, such as notice, choice, access, and security. Second, the framework says that companies that want to be in the safe harbor must certify and publicly declare that they follow the safe harbor principles in their own data practices, and that there then allows an entity like the Federal Trade Commission to enforce those promises if they fail to live up to them. So the FTC plays an essential role in the safe harbor framework because we are the agency that enforces companies' safe harbor commitments. Now the viability of the safe harbor was seriously threatened in June of 2013. I'm finally getting around to Snowden. I know you've been waiting for it. <laughs> When information that was provided by Snowden began to detail some of the data collection activities of the National Security Agency and other intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Many European officials, advocates, and citizens reacted to these revelations with outrage over what was reported. The European Parliament recommended suspending Safe Harbor. The European Commission took a different approach. It issued a report indicating that the safe harbor framework should be retained, but the commission demanded 13 changes. Now for more than a year, the Department of Commerce and the European Commission have been negotiating these changes. Many of the items on the European Commission's list are reforms that, in my view, make good sense and would improve safe harbor from a consumer protection standpoint. These changes include eliminating the fees that some EU consumers have to pay to have their safe harbor related disputes resolved, increasing transparency in the administration of the safe harbor program, and in increasing accountability within companies that are part of, that sign up for the safe harbor. Two of the European Commission's recommendations for improving safe harbor concern national security issues. The current safe harbor framework as well as other mechanisms governing data transfers in the commercial sphere, such as binding corporate rules, and even the EU Data Protection Directive itself. All of these tools and mechanisms include exceptions for national security and law enforcement. The Snowden revelations began a robust conversation on both sides of the Atlantic about whether we, as societies, have struck the right balance in the law enforcement and national security arenas. And th by that I mean the right balance between security and law enforcement on the one hand and privacy and data security on the other. The Charlie Hebdo and Jewish market attacks, as well as this past weekend's attacks in Copenhagen, have added some important new perspectives to this discussion in Europe. The conversation on both sides of the Atlantic is critically important, but in my view, it should be distinct from the issues surrounding companies' collection and use of consumer data. In the context of companies' collection and use of consumer data, I believe the safe harbor gives the Federal Trade Commission an effective tool to protect the privacy of consumers both in the EU and in the United States. As such, 
safe harbor is a solution and not a problem. The FTC has settled 24 actions against companies that either allegedly falsely stated that they were in safe harbor but actually were not, or claimed to meet safe harbor's substantive requirements but did not. So where do we go from here? As business leaders, business students, business professors in a business school, you probably think about this question the same way that you think about mid-February in New Hampshire, which is, we've put a lot behind us, but there's still a long way to go. <laughs> I spent a many years in Vermont, so I know exactly how it feels. In terms of the discussion with our European colleagues, I am optimistic that resolving the tensions that have understandably arisen, th that we will resolve the tensions that have understandably arisen uh, since June of 2013. Part of my optimism goes back to the common privacy principles that I believe we share and the efforts underway on both sides of the Atlantic to examine whether our different privacy frameworks are able to sufficiently protect consumers in the era of big data and the Internet of Things. So going forward, the appropriate measure of pro pro progress, from my view, should not be which system wins. I've been asked that before, most recently in a debate that I had with a high-level Brussels uh, official um, at a conference in Brussels. So I don't think it's an issue of which of the two systems will win. Instead, I think the appropriate measure is whether the United States and Europe develop practical, effective, and interoperable frameworks that will allow data to be adequately protected and to flow between our economies. Neither the, neither the US nor Europe is going to succeed without getting privacy and data security right, as they are key elements to engendering consumer trust. I think consumers, and frankly businesses, need and deserve nothing less. So thanks very much, and uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you. So I'm going to put my glasses back on. Yeah, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go to you. At the beginning, you pointed out the U.S. does not have a comprehensive privacy right. law, but it has a variety of various laws that affect different sectors, et cetera. And then eventually you said that you thought our system could be improved. Absolutely. And I guess what I'm wondering whether you meant by that that we should have a comprehensive data privacy law or a baseline if that's something different. So um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the, cons the President's uh, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, which has been under development for um, a while, uh, would, I believe, you know, it serve that purpose. It would be baseline privacy legislation. And um, the President announced at the Cyber Summit in Stanford last Friday that uh, he was going to be um, offering up for public comment a bill that will, that will be the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. So that would be the base, a baseline law that would help fill some of the gaps that I think are out there and that I you know, identified in my talk. I'm very supportive of the principle of baseline privacy legislation, and I think we're going to need to see um, and look very carefully at what is proposed by the White House um, to ensure that the FTC has effective enforcement tools at its disposal. Because my view is one of the things that we do really well in the United States when it comes to privacy and data security is appropriate and careful yet robust enforcement. And I, don't th I think that if we lose that, w we would end up losing a lot. So a lot more to be um, discussed when it comes to baseline privacy uh, legislation, but that's what the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights is designed to, uh, to provide. Yeah. So when you covered the, a lot of the similarities and differences in terms of how the U.S. and the EU think about data privacy, and, and I think despite some of those differences, it sounds like culturally we're more similar. Um, I wonder when you get into markets like China and Russia, what happens? And so I'd love to hear about conversations that you have with companies and how they think about this stuff, both from you know, an operational and regulatory perspective, and also just from a values and cultural perspective. Um, it's, uh, what, I'm he what I hear from companies, by the way, do I need to repeat the question? Um, for anybody? Okay. You all, great. So what I hear from companies is that it can be challenging. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly the data localization laws. 
Um, there are also conversations underway regarding uh, things like uh, keys to encryption and whatnot, and it can be quite challenging. Um, you know, when it comes to some of the major tech companies, um, they uh, are really understand the need to enhance privacy and security because it's becoming a market value proposition for them. I mean, you've seen that all. You've you heard. Tim, or you heard about Tim Cook's speech on Friday, and that's just the latest example of many statements being made by Microsoft, Google, and, and others uh, to, to, to understand that they have to protect privacy and security. And it becomes difficult when they're being faced with demands uh, from uh, countries uh, such as those that you've identified, whether it's uh, taking down information um, that Google is displaying, whether it's on YouTube or whatnot, that might be politically sensitive to regimes that are in place, um, or, or, or encryption keys. I think all the companies are trying to work within the systems uh, that they, uh, uh, where they find themselves and are trying to work through the problems, you know, one by one, but it, but it is challenging. Having said that, <coughs> I think if you talk to some companies, they would say it's been challenging dealing with the United States government at times, too. And there clearly has been reported tensions between uh, Silicon Valley, if you will, but that just is representative of the larger tech community, and some of the concerns around transparency with respect to the demands for, for to open up um, information that they have. And the companies very much want to be more transparent, and so there's been a lot of discussion on that, on that level, too. So, um, we can talk about, and the level of challenges obviously varies a great deal, and it can be much more challenging in some other environments, but I don't want to respond to that without also mentioning that there are challenges here in the United States as well. Yeah? I'm not up on the latest attempts on to legislation, uh, legislation, but I'm just, uh, I, I would, I'm hoping you can comment on something, which is you mentioned that the, um, national security issue you see as sort of separate as the um, consumer data issue and yet I know there have been somewhat recent um, attempts um, of maybe it's by the FBI or the National Security Agency to say we need to have like backdoor ways to decrypt data um, which I think would bode extremely ill for any consumer privacy because backdoors can be kind of infiltrated by anybody so um, that is a connection, I don't, um, and I hope that you can comment on it. I don't know what the FTC has to do with all of that. So, um, for someone who, you started out by saying you don't know much about it, you, you know an awful lot about it, so don't, don't downplay your, your level of, of recognition of the key issues. So, the Federal Trade Commission, we don't get involved in national security issues at all. We focus on um, consumer issues uh, and competition issues, and uh, so when we're looking, when the privacy and data security sphere, we're looking at what companies are doing vis-a-vis -vis consumers. Um, and as a result, we don't really comment on, I can note what the, the dialogue is and what the debates are around national security issues, but we don't comment on how they should turn out or who's, who's right or, or who's wrong. I'm, uh, you're absolutely right. There's a connection, and there are people that I've heard speak who say that we should be thinking not about consumers' uh, interactions with companies or, cit or citizens' interactions vis-a-vis -vis government, but we should just be talking about individuals because it's all one thing. And I think there's a lot of merit to that argument. But the reason why I say they're separate and they should be dealt with separately, that is, what's happening, what companies are doing vis-a-vis -vis consumers, and what governments are doing vis-a-vis -vis both companies and citizens is because the tools to address them, the way that they're going to be addressed is going to be very different. And the values at stake, I also believe, are different. When it comes to companies, how they're using individual data for um, whether it's to figure out what ads you want to see or to offer you up the next movie you might want to see or to profile you for the purpose of whether or not you're a good customer, whether or not you're trustworthy, or what race you are, or whether you're financially vulnerable and maybe ought to go into a category that of people who get targeted by payday lenders and others. All of these things are things that I think get addressed through, through tools like the Federal Trade Commission Act, our Section 5, State Attorney General's civil laws, and whatnot. When it comes to national security, there's a, there's a different balance, I think, that may be struck 
between access to information and use of information on the one hand and then privacy protection. I'm not saying where that balance comes out, but I think it, it's gonna, it, it should be different. The, what's at stake is different. And, what, and who needs to know what for what purposes is different. And most importantly, the tools to address it here in the United States and frankly, everywhere, um, uh, especially in Europe, are different. So just as one example, the European Commission, which is, again, uh, the entity that um, has placed these demands on the US, <coughs> excuse me, for improving safe harbor, they don't deal with national security at all. The European Commission doesn't deal with national security issues. The European Commission um, does deal with privacy and does deal with data security vis-a-vis -vis companies, but national security and law enforcement issues are dealt with at the member state level not at the commission level. So we just saw um, the, Fran the French interior minister and the French um, uh, justice official, the, like our attorney, the equivalent of our attorney general, were just in the United States and presented a very different, had a very different discussion with both um, folks in Washington as well as folks out in Silicon Valley about the need to be able to unlock um, encryption. So you hear the commission saying one thing, about privacy and security and whatnot. And then you hear the member states saying something different. So it's a really interesting discussion about who should be talking about national security issues when it comes to Europe. Now, I'm not saying the commission doesn't have a role, and I'm not saying that the DPAs, the data protection authorities, don't have a role. If they want to talk about it and it's important to them, they should be talking about it. But it's fundamentally an issue that gets dealt with at the member state level. So. It's a very interesting question. I, I mean, we, we could spend a whole day talking about the interrelationship between national security on the one hand and companies' use of data and consumer uh, issues on the other. But I think it, <coughs> excuse me, is much more beneficial to really be thinking about them separately because for all the reasons that I identified. Yeah, and then we'll go around. Sure, go ahead. Uh, two very separate questions that <laughs> cut me off if you like. Uh, first, I was, I was intrigued by some of your earlier comments around the um, FTC tackling uh, kind of separate practices. And I was thinking that for the most part, I don't think consumers actually know what they're sliding away. Right. So I was wondering whether the main way to address that was the Consumer Bill of Rights or are there other what methods that the FTC might be looking at to tackle that issue? Um, and then secondly, kind of go back to that, the probably speaking, call it the balkanization of, of the internet potentially. Um, does the FTC see its role abroad as kind of making sure that the internet stays open for US kind of e-commerce companies and Facebook, Google, the rest of them? So uh, let's take them one at a time. Um, your first, I mean, but I want to make sure I understand your first question. So your first question is, uh, consumers don't understand how their data is being used, right? And so will the consumer, or, or they don't understand how companies are using data, right? Or, or what they're giving away. Or, apps or what they're giving away. Um, and will, the, will, will a consumer privacy bill of rights address that issue? Um, so again, we don't have the, any legislative language yet, but in theory, a consumer um, bill of rights could, could well address that issue by requiring more transparency and more effective tools be given to consumers to, under, to understand this. And remember in my talk I said, you know, companies can do a lot of these things right now. You don't actually need to have the law enacted for companies to engage in some of these best practices. Frankly, I've been proposing now for a couple of years that data brokers and other entities that are operating behind the scenes and using information in a completely non-transparent way. C consumers don't even know that these companies exist, let alone how to reach them and how to find out what information they have about them. These companies could all create a portal where consumers could go to see what, how they're being profiled, what where the information came from, and could suppress it if it's used for marketing purposes or correct it if it's used for more substantive purposes, like is this a trusty consumer that we should be dealing with. I call it Reclaim Your Name. I've been calling for it for a couple of years. It's now been adopted by the FTC in our report on data brokers and also by the White House. And it's, they, well, the White House did a big data report as well. So um, 
yes, legislation, even, even data broker specific legislation could just focus on this issue and could enhance greatly, I think, how consumers' information, what they're giving away, and how it's being used. Um, but companies could do this right now. Legislation really isn't required. And one data broker has taken this step. One data broker, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, called Axiom. Again, I don't, you, many of you probably have never heard of these companies. But Axiom has a portal. They call it aboutthedata.com. And you can go on it. And you can see aboutthedata.com, all one word. And you can go on it and see what information they have about you. Now, it's only a certain subset of the data they have. It's only their marketing data. It's not the data that's used for more substantive purposes. And also, it's, you, you're given limited choices about it. But you are given some choices. So I think it's a good first step along this line. But a lot more needs to be done. It could be a much better tool. And many more data brokers should be doing the same thing. And it should all be done at the same place, because consumers have no idea where these, who these companies are. No one can remember their names because you're not dealing with them on a first party basis. I also think that companies that get information from data brokers and companies that supply information to data brokers could be a lot more transparent about what they're doing. I mean, let's face it, and I think you're alluding to this, consumers aren't reading these long privacy notices. And we've been saying at the FTC for two years, these privacy notices are completely outdated and need, they're important. We need to have them for law enforcement purposes and, frankly, for purposes of um, you know, uh, investigative reporters to dive deep into what companies are doing. But notice and transparency needs to become a much more consumer-friendly concept. I, I like to say we need to get kick the lawyers out of the room and bring in the advertisers and bring in the marketing people because they know how to communicate with consumers. It needs to be just-in-time, immersive information that's given to consumers. And if all that's done, I think consumers will be in a much better position to have an understanding. And now think about connected devices, which don't have any interface. There's no place where consumers can look and you know, pu push buttons and see what's happening. So we're, we need to s continue to be much more creative about how transparency and notice and choice is going to be given to consumers as we move into the, uh, the Internet of Things. OK, your second question about is it our job to help ensure that the internet remains an open um, platform? It's not really our job. There are others that do that. Um, the Department of Commerce and uh, what does NTIA stand for again? National, National Telecommunications Yeah, that, so um, Aaron Burstein, who's with me and on my staff, <coughs> worked at the Commerce Department. And I always forget what the acronym actually stands for. But these are the guys whose job, as well, excuse me, as well as some folks at the State Department. Um, there are, you know, people who, whose jo entire job it is. Uh, Danny Sepulveda is one, you know, who have ambassador level and, and Senate um, confirmation type status, uh, whose job it is to do precisely that, to try to work with other countries to help them understand the importance of the internet remaining an open platform. Working with ICANN, for instance, to improve its process. Uh, to ensure that it remains sort of an open platform as well. So our, my, I view our role, the FTC's role, is not so much ensuring that th that, but um, to help explain how we do privacy protection and help explain how we do law enforcement generally, which frankly is an important part of all these conversations because you have people around the world saying, well, what are you doing? You don't have you know, a baseline privacy law. How are you... What are you doing with these companies? And so we have to go through exactly what I went through with you to help explain how we actually have a very sophisticated and robust enforcement regime, still, though, one that can be improved. Just like Europeans are recognizing, they may have a robust regime, but it needs some improvement, too. So is there a question over here? Are we uh, out of time? Oh, I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you. Or if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. So thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Of course. Of course. Oh, that was sweet of you. You didn't need to do that. Thank you. <laughs>